sanctuary for you. Glad to be when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shores. I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away when I die. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning and those that are online as well. Uh, just a couple of uh, quick announcements for family. Um, I was informed that I need a Studebaker. Of course, she just passed away. She'll, they'll have a private service on Thursday, a private family service, and hopefully a public service in June if that works out. And also, I think Tony just informed us that uh, Candy Bell's father passed away today, I believe, and we don't have any more details, so you might keep your eyes open for those, those details coming up. I couldn't help but, uh, as I was listening to Gene in class this morning, he talked about being excited. Days like today, it's a little hard to get excited. <laughs> he talked about lighting the fire. Uh, that's very appropriate today, so hopefully we'll be able to light a fire, but uh, I'm going to read out of Psalms, Psalms 118 is a passage this morning, uh, beginning in verse 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief corner stone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Just a reminder this morning that no matter what the circumstances are outside, no matter what circumstances are in our lives, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let's begin with a prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we're so mindful of the opportunity we have to worship you, to praise you, to uh, send up our uh, thankfulness to you, in, in everything we do. But Father, we pray that we'll be that way each day, especially today as we worship you, as we praise you, for this is your day. Every day uh, can be your day if we make it in our lives. We ask you to be with us as we worship this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing this next selected, selected song. For those of you wondering, today is Scout Sunday. That's why I'm wearing my uniform. I love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. Love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people, what a sight just to see all the happy faces, praising God in heavenly places. 
next selected song will be 867. You may be seated. <clears throat> to Canaan's land I'm on my way where the soul of man never dies. My darkest night will turn to day where the soul never Soul 
Last one for today, before we prepare for the Lord's Supper, will be 902. <laughs> what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other felt I know. Nothing but the blood of Good morning, church. Good morning. And also, good morning to those online. We want to invite you at this time to the Lord's table. Um, as I share with you the Lord's Supper, I just want to give you just a few verses that you can also commit to memory. I'd like to do that to help you. First of all, the, um, the Passover it's very much uh, related to the, the, the Lord's Supper. You know, the Passover is also called the Lord's Passover. The Lord's Supper is also called the Lord's Supper. So what does that tell you? It's God. Listen carefully and uh, pay attention. I think that's what he's saying. In Exodus uh, chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. See, easy to remember. The Jewish Passover, he says uh, in the scripture, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will come upon you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So there's blood. There's a life and death situation. Now this day shall be a memorial to you and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. So it's a celebration for the deliverance of the Lord, for the victory of the Lord, for the power of the Lord. Throughout your generation, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. 
though it is to be celebrated for generations and generations. It must be important. But what happened? This memorial feast involving the body and the blood of a sacrificial lamb from the time of Moses so that the people of Israel will remember and be reminded of God's presence, protection, providence, and the power to save and sustain their lives in the present, in the past, and generations to come. But they failed to observe the Lord's Supper. They failed to observe the Lord's Passover. From the time of Judges, the scripture says that, to the time of King Josiah. And between the time of Judges and the time of King Josiah, it's at least 500 years they forget to observe the Lord's Passover. This is a major, if you read the scriptures, you'll find that this is a major indication that the children of Israel turn away from God. And it says in 2 King 23, 23, I like that. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was celebrated in the Lord, in Jerusalem. And Josiah was complimented by God for doing what he's doing. The Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians Verse 11, 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord, the Apostle Paul said, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup, of the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So just like the, the Lord's Passover, likewise, the Lord's Supper is a memorial feast involving the body and blood of the sacrificial lamb, the Son of God, so that we can proclaim the Lord's death till he comes again. And to remember, we partake of the Lord's Supper, and to be reminded through Jesus of God's presence, of God's protection, providence, power, and wisdom to save and sustain our lives towards eternity. In the present, in the past, and generation to come. That's why we remember the Lord. Just like as mentioned in 1 Corinthians one twenty four, when we remember the Lord, the memorial feast triggers in our mind who Jesus is, why we remember him, and in short, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, but to those who are called like us, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Don't you want to remember him? It's so wonderful. So let's partake of the Lord's Supper. Okay, let's bow our head together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your wisdom and then for your word and then for your power. We thank you, Father, for uh, this time that we can all get it together around your table and partake of the Lord's Supper. We thank you, Father, for this bread which represents the body of Christ, uh, broken and, I mean, like a sacrifice for each and every one of us. So, Father, that we can uh, uh, have life with you. As we partake of this bread, help us, Father, to do it in a manner that is uh, pleasing to you. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's bow our head together again. Lord, likewise, we want to uh, give you thanks for the fruit of the vine that represents the precious blood of Jesus shed for each and every one of us. We know, Father, without the shedding of this blood, there's no new covenant. And because there's a new covenant, we thank you, Lord, for your promise and your seal that one day we'll be with you in heaven. We thank you for that. And as we partake of this uh, fruit of the vine, again, help us, Father, to take it, pleasing to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. The Lord's Supper, you think about it, uh, has a lot of eloquence. It expresses, it can, be, it can express many things. The Lord's Supper could also remind us of the example of the sacrificial giving and contribution of the Son of God. We can see that. As his disciples, we could learn from Jesus about a Christian life of giving and sacrifice. And therefore, he says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting from verse 6 to verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to verse 8. Now this I say, he who sold sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he who sold bountifully, shall also reap bountifully. Let each one do just as he has purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, but God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make full grace abound to you. We need a lot of his grace. Um, all sufficiency in everything you may have in abundance for every good deed. So let us give generously, and I also want to assure you that uh, whatever we spend, the eyes of the deacons are on it, and whatever we spend, the elders also look over it. So I must say that uh, with the Lord's help, we are all in good hands as far as God's resources are concerned, and, uh, and the Lord has blessed us tremendously. Let's bow our head together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, at this time as we uh, again learn from Jesus how to give. And as we give, help us, Father, to give you cheerfully and uh, generously. And we thank you again for this opportunity. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you are evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the prayer. free from your passion and pride. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Storm for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power Wider than snow, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is 
there's power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power. In the precious blood of the Lamb. The song right before Wayne's lesson will be number 608. <coughs> he took my burdens all the way up to a brighter day. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. A wonderful song I now can sing In my heart joy bell rings He gave me a song A wonderful song He gave me a song To sing about He lifted me He lifted me From Some of these days in that fair land, sing with a joyous grand. Morning. Morning. Reading from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 through 16, Paul writes, What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended, higher than all the heavens, in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature at attaining at the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves 
and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craft, craftiness of men in their deceitful schemes. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Good morning, Eastwood family. Galen reminded us this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen? Uh, Connor also reminded me that it's 12 degrees outside and it feels like zero. So that's the day that the Lord has blessed us with, but we are so thankful that uh, you're out and about here and so thankful for those that are joining us online. This morning I want to talk for a few minutes about the importance of teamwork. The importance of teamwork. Now, all of us have heard statements and lessons about team dynamics, team strength, team members. And let me try to define team this way. That a team is a collection of individuals that have talents, ability, and desire, and enthusiasm. Uh, uh, Brother talk, uh, Gene talked a little bit about enthusiasm this morning in uh, adult Bible class. Having those, those energies channeled together to try to accomplish the task. Now, I do believe it is very important for us to think about when we're talking about team, that when we look at the great accomplishments in life, whether that be in science or entertainment or sports or even in the church, you know that great things happen with a group of people, a team. Very rarely is it the single individual, the, the female or the male that arises and, and succeeds and all by themselves, but when you study them individually and collectively and carefully, that you, you realize they actually had a team around them that helped raise them to experience that greatness of whatever that they have done. Now, even in the very beginning, we could go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, that it wasn't good for Adam, for man to be alone, so God gave him that, that helper, that completer, that companion, that teammate, if you will, to accomplish all that God would have for them to do in the Garden of Eden. Now, if you happen to have your Bibles handy, I want us to go back to the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, and we're going to be in chapter 5 in just a few moments. I'd like to review, though, perhaps there's one or two here that are with us today, and, and perhaps some people that are turning in online that haven't been with us as we've started this series of lessons on rebuilding, renewal, and restoration. We're using that Old Testament book of Nehemiah to emphasize a lot of very important life lessons. Now in chapter number one, we see Nehemiah developing a great teammate, and that's King Artaxerxes. Now Nehemiah is a very powerful and influential cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. And Nehemiah is praying about the king that the king would change his heart to give him permission to go down to Jerusalem, and God answers that prayer. And uh, Artaxerxes also gives him permission letters to travel safely down there. He gives him permission to get timber to help build the, the wall and the gates. And he even gives him the armed escort to go down to Jerusalem to begin rebuilding on the wall. Artaxerxes is a great teammate of Nehemiah. But then when you go to chapter 2, Nehemiah has gone down to, uh, to Jerusalem. He's been examining the walls to see what is it going to take to rebuild these things. And if you'll look there very carefully in verse number 18, I love what the scripture reveals about Nehemiah as he gets the people together and explains his vision of rebuilding this wall. Look with me in verse 18. I also told them about how the gracious hand of my God was upon me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. And that's exactly what they did. Because you go to chapter 3 and we see families. We see groups of individuals coming together to rebuild the wall. And then as you come to chapter 4 and you get to verse number 6, look there. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half of its height. For the people worked with all of their heart. Isn't that beautiful? Can't you just see this collection of people working as this great team? And now they've got that wall halfway built to where it needs to be. But along that journey, and it's just been a few weeks that they've been rebuilding this wall, they're going to hit some walls of discouragement that we talked about last week. 
They're going to be physically exhausted. There's constant external oppositions to their rebuilding. They're focusing more on the problems than the end goal of rebuilding this wall. And it's about to stop. But Nehemiah is a great leader. He inspires the people to keep on building. He leads them back to God. He gives them a plan to continue to deal with the opposition that's coming. And he says, we need to rally together. Whenever we get in trouble, we're getting stuck, we're being attacked by our enemies, let's rally together. And the work continues on. Well, now as we come to chapter 5, I'm going to show you some problems that are going to take place that Nehemiah is going to have to deal with. But before I get there, I want to make two very important points as I begin. Number one, if you and I are teammates like we're supposed to be as recorded in Scripture in the Word of God, we can face all kinds of problems externally and internally and we'll do very well. However, if we are not the kinds of teammates that we're supposed to be, the kinds of teammates, whether at our work, in the church, in our homes, very few problems externally or internally will help us, will pull us apart. And it doesn't take very much for us not to continue to do what God would have for us to do. We see it in our own families, don't we? When we see husbands and wives on that same team. We see children that are listening to their parents. We see parents that are parenting their kids the way God instructs them to do that. That family, all kinds of opposition can come against them. They stay together strong. But then we see it in the church, don't we? When we see all that it takes of a team for us to come together on a worship service, it's incredible. You know, before you got here today, there had to be some folks that came down here, turned on all the lights, got all of the, uh, the, the heating and the doors open, that the building was clean so that we'd have a good, safe, efficient place to come and worship in this morning. Others have been here already involved in our education program, teaching our young children the word of God, teaching our adults the, the word of God. If you're watching online here this morning, we got a team of people that are helping to send this out on the internet. Also, we've had a great team that have been leading us in worship this morning, reading scripture, Malachi all decked out in his, uh, in his uh, uh, Boy Scout stuff. He's an Eagle Scout now, right? Yeah, yes, sir. So very proud of the great job that he did and lead us in the scripture. And so we had a great team coming together to lead us in worship service. And each and every one of you have participated in prayer and, and singing and communion this morning. There's been a great team effort that has undergone. Now, remember, when we're the kind of teammates like we're supposed to be, it, you know, outside opposition, internal opposition, we can stay strong as we're the kind of teammates, but it wouldn't take very much to pull us apart if we're not being the kind of teammates that we need to be. So now that leads us to Nehemiah chapter 5. And so if you've got the, the Word of God handy in front of you, and I encourage you to do, to follow along this morning, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 5. Nehemiah chapter 5. We're going to learn some very important lessons on how teammates work together to overcome problems. Let's see what kind of problem Nehemiah and the people building that wall had to face uh, revealed in chapter number 5. Start with me in verse number 1. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against the Jewish brothers. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous in order for us to eat and stay alive. We must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields and our vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have to have to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards, although we are of the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we've had to subject our sons and our daughters to slavery. Now some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. And when I heard their outcry, and these charges, I was very angry. Wow. Nehemiah and the people had some serious problems to deal with. Some were saying, we need to get grain. We're numerous. There's a lot of us here, and we're hungry. We don't have enough food to eat. Others were saying, we're having to mortgage our, our fields and our, 
our homes and our vineyards. Still others are saying, hey, we're having to take out loans to be able to pay this high expensive tax that King Artaxerxes has put upon us. And then others are saying, you know, we're having to enslave our own children. Why? What's going on? A couple things. One, did you catch that there is a famine going on? Now, famines can be caused by a lot of things. Probably more than likely, it's, it's a drought that's taking place. And so some people there in Jerusalem that are trying to rebuild that wall, they're getting hungry. They don't have enough to eat. And then those that do actually have some resources, have vineyards, they have their houses, guess what? They're having to take a loan out just to buy grain, just to have enough food to eat. Imagine, you know, t maybe taking out a loan to buy a house to live in. Could you imagine mortgaging your entire farm just so that you could kind of feed your family? And then once you have ate for a week or two, what are you going to do if you can't pay that mortgage back? But then thirdly, there's this high tax that they're having to pay. So they're having to take out mortgages on that. Well, we also, as we're reading down through the text, we discovered that there's some nobles, there's some officials, there's some of these, these Jewish nobles and officials. Guess what they're doing? They've got money. And they said, okay, we'll loan you this this money, you're going to have to pay some interest, but we're going to need some collateral, so we'll need that deed to your farm, to that vineyard, to your house. And when they can't pay that mortgage, guess what? They're going to repossess that, so the rich are getting rich, richer, the poor are getting poorer, and then some are getting so desperate, they're having to sell their own children, their sons and their daughters, into slavery. Now, can you imagine that? You're building this wall, right? And so you're putting these, these blocks in place, and you're putting the mortar, and you're chiseling everything, and you just look down, and you see this guy that's taking your vineyard away from you, and you see him ordering your daughter around because you've had to sell her into slavery. What would that do to your morale? What would that do to those that are building the wall? It is absolutely going to destroy that project with the problems that are going on. Now, I hope you noticed Nehemiah's reaction once these people started explaining all the problems that they had. He said, I am very angry. Don't you appreciate Nehemiah? He is so real. Brothers and sisters, I hope from time to time you get fired up about some things. You know, when you see injustice, when you see disobedience to the word of God, I hope that moves you. When somebody's being abused and taken advantage of and neglected, I hope you get kind of fired up to do something in the right way. Now, these nobles and officials knew better than to do what they were doing. I'm going to show you clearly from the word of God this morning what they should have been doing in that situation. Here's some things that they were prohibited from doing under the law of Moses that they were following under. So keep your spot here in Nehemiah, but let's just do a little walk from some of the Old Testament scriptures through the law of Moses. Start with in, in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. It's very clear of what they should not have been doing in that situation. Go with me to Exodus 22, verse 25. So our first one is Exodus 22, verse 25. If you lend money to one of my people who is needy, do not be like a money lender. Charge him no interest. So yes, you can do some loans, but don't you charge fellow brother or sister any interest. All right, go to Leviticus now, Leviticus 25. See what it says. More information. Verse 35 through 40. Here the word of God says, Now if one of your countrymen becomes poor, he's unable to support himself among you, help him as you would an alien or a temporary resident, so he can continue to live among you. Do not take interest of any kind from him, but fear your God so that your countrymen may continue to live among you. You must not lend him money at interest or sell him food at a profit. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. Now, if one of your countrymen becomes poor among you and sells himself to you, do not make him work as a slave. He is to be treated as a hired worker or a temporary resident among you. He is to work for you until the year of Jubilee. And then later on, over here in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, notice this, verse 23. Or chapter 23, verse 19 and 20. Deuteronomy 23, 19 and 20. Do not charge your brother interest, whether on money or food or anything else that may earn interest. You may charge a foreigner interest, but not a brother Israelite, so that the Lord your God may bless you in everything you put your hand to in the land that you are entering to possess. What was God telling his people? You be different than everybody else that's around you. Don't be like the Gentiles. Don't be like a loan shark. Don't be charging people for the loans that you're giving. If you have a fellow brother that's struggling, that's hurting financially, you help him out. That's a brother that you need to help when he's going through a difficult situation. If they would follow God's laws, not enslave one another, not charge interest to one another. God would bless them. He would take care of them, protect the poor. So first thing that they need to do, they needed to look closely at what the real problem was. Okay, go back uh, to the book of Nehemiah now. Ne Nehemiah chapter 5. Look at verse 6 and 7. So after they've looked closely at the problem, Let's see how they needed to consider carefully what they needed to do. Verse 6. Now, when I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and the officials. And I told them, you are exacting usury from your own countrymen. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them. Now, again, he was very angry because of their treatment of their fellow brothers and sisters there. But he said he considered carefully. I like that word that he pondered them in his mind. He canceled himself. Aren't you thankful that he took this time to consider carefully before he spoke up, before he acted upon anything? It reminds me of what we can read about in the book of James, the New Testament book of James, chapter 1, verse 19. My brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So one of the best things that you and I can do whenever we're starting to get angry is to consider carefully. You ponder for a few minutes, because what is said is said, what is done is done, and you cannot rewrite that history. You've got to experience those consequences that are going to come. So realize what the problem is, but before you start saying and doing something, you better consider carefully what's going to be the outcome if I do. But thirdly, we're going to notice here, he is going to respond biblically. He's going to respond biblically to this situation. Let's read about that. That's verses 7 through 13. Let's look at that now. Verse 7, I pondered them in my mind and I accused the nobles and the officials and I told them, you are exacting usury from your own countrymen. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have bought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you're selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet. Because they could find nothing to say. So I continued. What you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? And I and my brothers and my men are also lending people money and grain. But let the exacting of usury stop. Give back to them immediately their fields, their vineyards, their olive groves, their houses, and also the usury that you're charging them, the hundredth part of the money, grain, new wine, and oil. We will give it back, they said. And we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. 
And then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and the officials take an oath to do what they had promised. And I shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way, may God shake out of his house and possessions every man who does not keep this promise. So may such a man be shaken out and emptied. And at this, the whole assembly said, amen, praise the Lord. And the people did as they promised. So, Nehemiah responds biblically to the situation. He gathers together all those nobles and officials who were doing what they ought not to have done, making these loans, charging interest, having their fellow Jewish brothers and sisters and these sons and daughters be sold into slavery. And he said, you need to stop selling your fellow Israelites into slavery. You need to stop charging interest on your loans. You need to give back those fields, those vineyards, those olive groves, and the interest that you have been charging them. Now, few things are more emphasized in Scripture than how we ought to take care of those that are hurting, to take care of those that are being disadvantaged, those that are struggling financially. And all of us have seen this, haven't we? This is the way that the world responds. But you see somebody in a difficult situation. Maybe a death has taken place. Maybe a, a, a farmer is losing his farm. And so all of a sudden, these financial vultures come in and pick apart these folks. And they're buying these things at highway robbery prices. They're not giving them fair market value for things that they have worked and sacrificed for. They're at a disadvantaged state, and the world comes and swoops them away. We need to be reminded, if we're ever tempted in those situations, do not forget this warning from the Lord. Luke chapter 12 and 15. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. Because Nehemiah is acting biblically in accordance with the word of God, how do the people respond? They said, we're going to agree to do that. We're going to give them back their lands. We're not going to make loans with any of this interest anymore. But you see, Nehemiah is a wise man. He's a very spiritually minded man. He knows a lot of things can be promised in life, especially if you're caught into an emotional situation. So what does he do? He calls in the priests, people that know the word of God, those that would be kind of those mature leaders in the community, and he has those officials and those nobles that take an oath in front of them and before God that they are going to uphold their word. They say, amen, we're going to do it. And, he's, and, and uh, Nehemiah gives them a visual aid. He takes his robe and he says, if you do not follow up on your word, you're going to be shook out. Just like God has shaken the nation. Just like he shook out um, Israel earlier. Just as he shook out Jerusalem earlier and all their possessions, I'll shake it out again. And they said, amen, praise the Lord. And I love it. They did what they promised that they were going to do. They did what they promised that they were going to do. They responded biblically. But then this last little section as we finish up chapter 5, I want you to know how they live consistently. Look at this great example that Nehemiah, here's a person I believe would be easy for any of us to follow after because he lived such a consistent life. Uh, in accord with the word of God. Look at this. Start with me in verse 14. Moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be governor in the land of Judah until his 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those that preceded me, placed a heavy burden on the people, took 40 shekels of silver from them, in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people, but out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to work on the wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me, and every 10 days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. In spite of all this, I'll never, I'd never demanded the food allotted to the governor because of the demands were heavy on these people. Remember me, Lord, with favor. Oh, my God, for I have done for these people. Wow. 
He lived consistently. Now, his predecessors, previous governors, they had no problem putting a tax on the people. In fact, uh, even if his assistants liked to lord it over the people, they could put a tax. But Nehemiah never did that. He never acquired any lands. He didn't exempt himself from the work. Oh, in chapter 3, you re read about some nobles from Tekoa who wouldn't get involved in the wall, beating, uh, wall building project. There's always an element that don't join in and help out. But that wasn't Nehemiah. That wasn't his men. And look at all the people that he was having to take care of, that he was having to feed, all of his administration. And then when people from other countries would come, he would provide all of that. And why did he do that? Out of reverence for God. He was a man of God. He wanted to be a, a, an example as a leader. Nehemiah was a tremendous example, and we can learn a lot from him and how to deal with problems in a, in a biblical and effective way. Let's talk about teamwork for just a minute or two here. So I'm always looking for examples, real-life examples, and try to illustrate truth. And so we could go to you know, Proverbs chapter 6, and verse 6, that talks about a sluggard, you ought to go and look at an ant to see what work is all about and how to be in, industrious. Or Jesus, didn't he use a child to say, if you want to enter into the kingdom of God, you need to be humble like a child. Well, just a few weeks ago, um, I hear there's a football go game going on tonight. I, I don't know, have you guys heard about that? Well, just a few weeks ago, the Kansas City Chiefs were playing the Buffalo Bills in this uh, championship game to see who, could, who got to go uh, to the Super Bowl. And one of the uh, real star players for Kansas City, his name is Nicole Hardman. You know, usually he's really sure-handed, but in the first quarter, he was supposed to be returning a punt, and he took his eye off the ball for a second and fumbled it, and Buffalo recovered, and in the very next play, they scored a touchdown. Kansas City is down 9-0. to zero. Again, this is a championship game. People all over the world are watching this game. How do you think Nicole felt? Dropping that ball, putting his team down 9 nothing. Oh, yeah, you should have seen. You probably, may, many of you may have watched that game. He slams his helmet down. He falls down on the, on the bench there and covers himself up. But you see, Kansas City demonstrated an amazing example of what I believe teammanship, teamwork in that situation. One of their star players, uh, uh, Travis Kelsey, he's one of the tight ends there, all pro tight end. He said, hey, there's more plays to be made. You just got to trust those guys up in front of you. So hearing from a, a leader on the team. But then Pat Mahomes, the quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs, he's like, McCall, 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 come here, look at me. And he takes that thing off him. He's so embarrassed. He's, high. he's like, look at me. You be you. You're going to make some plays this game. You're going to make some plays this game. And guess what he was able to do? Later on in the game, Coach called a play. They were down there close to the end zone. Threw a pass to him. He caught a touchdown. Later on, they had a special run that he ran, a jet sweep. He ran for over 50 yards. And those two plays, I believe, played a very important role in the success of Kansas City that day. But that was, all right, can you advance her? There we go. All right, that's him catching the touchdown. But I believe part of their success as a team that allowed them to make it to the Super Bowl is because of the teamwork that they have for one another. So as we think about Nehemiah's example, dealing with problems in his situation, look at the kind of team that they were. And imagine us as a team, because we really are. Each individual members, but collectively, we're all part of a team. We've got gifts, we've got talents, we got objectives that we need to accomplish, we need to edify, build up one another, we need to evangelize, we need to exalt God in worship, and we can't do it just one or two people trying to do it. We're all doing this together to accomplish this. And when we do it together as a team, no matter what the external opposition or threat, no matter what may come internally, we can be very, very strong and overcome them problems as we deal with them, as we look at the problem, as we kind of consider carefully before we make a decision of what we're going to say or what we're going to do. And then, of course, we're always going to try to respond in, in a biblical way and try to live as a good example from that. Oh, even when there's difficult problems that come against the church, man, we can be strong. But if we're not the kind of team member that we need to be, 
even the smallest problems will pull us apart. And so that could be in your family. That could be in your personal life. That can be in the church. So we're going to offer the invitation. If anybody is subject to the invitation, you don't have to respond to come all the way up here. If you want to do that, that's fine. You can respond in your chair. You can respond at home to start making some of these differences that we talked about here this day. If you are subject, won't you come as we stand and as we sing? Jesus, for the cleansing power, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you holy, trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? On your garments, spotless, are they white as snow? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood? You know, as Christians, isn't it great to be part of a winning team? <laughs> Let us pray together. Let us pray for all those suffering with health, health issues and for families that have lost loved ones. I need a Healy, or I need a Studebaker and her family just recently for healing of the divisions in our country and community. Lord, help us not put our faith in man, but instead put all of our faith in you, Lord. You will treat us with love and grace. Let us be loving in the same way to our brothers and sisters. Help us to be good teammates as we work to our goal of heaven. Lord, thank you for providing grace and forgiveness through your sacrifice. Help us to follow your examples that you have left for us in your word. We give all the praise to you, Lord. Amen.
makes you wait.